Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. We are on our Wednesday Holy Spirit study, and we're in our booklet. That's on page 33. And uh, before we get started, let's have ourselves a word of prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just come before you praising you and glorifying you because of who you are and what you do for us and the way you take care of us and, and for everything, Father. We pray that you help us as we learn about your Holy Spirit, that we might understand how you function in our lives and how what, what it is you expect of us and what faithfulness means. We ask that you would be, Father, with those people we mentioned before who are sick and who are having difficulty in the flesh. We, we pray, Father, that you would bless them, that you would help them and that you'd be with them and their families. Uh, we're so thankful for the health that you do give us, for the time that you allot us here, but we're even more thankful that after this life is over, Father, you have a place prepared for your, peop for your people, and so we look forward to being with you in that place when this life is over. We ask you to look down upon us and forgive us for our sins because we are human and we fail from time to time, but we also pray, Father, that you help us to put away sin from our lives and help us to be better servants of yours and better uh, models of, of what you would want us to be. We praise you and thank you for all things, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we are looking in our, in our booklet on page 33, and we have been covering the course of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that, we have been, that we've noticed just real quickly in brief is that the Holy Spirit is not some kind of force or, or power. The Holy Spirit is, is a being just like the Father's a being and the Holy Spirit and Jesus is a being. They're not the same being, apparently, it seems like, at least from what the Scriptures teach us, but they are still considered one from the standpoint that they function together, they work together, they're a unit together. However you want to use that word one, we point, point, often point out to you it's the same word that's used when the Bible says that the man and the woman became one flesh. Uh, and so there is that's the same way in which the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, though they are individual um, beings. And uh, we, we also notice that the, the Holy Spirit then uh, has the same um, identity and the same work and the same name as the Father and the Son, and therefore he's, he's, he is considered to be God. Uh, we also uh, looked at the, at the work of the Holy Spirit from the beginning of creation to the time that God called his people Israel, and we noticed how, what the Holy Spirit did there. And then we notice that the Holy Spirit's function was from the time that he, that God called the, uh, his nation uh, until the time of Jesus, and we looked at that. Uh, and uh, what we learned in there is that the Holy Spirit comes whenever something starts or needs to be started. The Holy Spirit comes in order to inform the individuals of what needs to happen. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit, uh, it seems, uh, expects the individuals, the faithful that he talked to, to propagate that information throughout their history, through their children, and through their teaching. And so we don't see the Holy Spirit coming down on each individual person in the same way that he came down at the inception of these various uh, concepts or these various tasks. And so that's what we've noticed. And so when we get to the New Testament, we kind of expected it to notice the same pattern. Uh, we also looked at the fact that as you take a look at the life of Jesus, that the Bible tells us that there's no way that you can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been looking at. We notice that there's no way that you can tell that Jesus is the Messiah except through the information that the Holy Spirit gave in the Old Testament through the prophets and through Isaiah and through those individuals. And so that's one of the things that we, we looked at. So now we're here in our, in our paper on page 33. Uh, we're in the middle of that page where it says the Spirit's work in the life of Jesus. And so as we begin to, to look there at that section, one of the things that we're noticing is, again, we're noticing how is it that we can say Jesus is Lord, and we're going to look at that from the standpoint of his physical life. And as we do that, I think it will help us to understand just exactly how that's being used so that we might be able to better understand what it means for Jesus to be Lord and how we come to that, how, how we come to that conclusion. And one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, first of all, and just notice a couple of concepts that you're familiar with that I just want to emphasize as we get ready to take a look here at this concept that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, no one can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so that's really what we're looking at, and we're looking at in the life of Jesus. You couldn't tell that he is the Messiah without the Holy Spirit, 
And now we want to look at the life of Jesus and just notice some things. Verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 5 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Uh, and so what we notice here is that it tells us that Jesus gave up equality with God to come down here and live as a man down here. And so when you think about the idea of living as a man, there are certain characteristics or qualities that are inherent to our nature. Uh, there are certain limitations that we have to our nature just simply because we are uh, human. Uh, and uh, there, there's a difference in the uh, nature of angels. For example, we know that, that angels can do things that we can't do. Well, why? Because that's inherent in their nature. And there's things that uh, we can do that animals can't do. Well, why? Because it's inherent in their nature because that's the way God made us. So there's, there's things that are inherent to our nature, and when it says that Jesus became a man, he then became limited to all those limitations that we have as a result of our nature. It's kind of like if, if you decided that you wanted to be a dog, well, then you're going to have certain limitations if you're a dog. And, you know, you have to deal with those limitations uh, in, in order to do that. And so Jesus is is becoming like us. So, so the, the question that it says is, it, for, for Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, it says, what does Philippians 2, 5 through 8 say Jesus gave up to become a man? What did he give up? He gave up equality with God. Here's God up here, and God has certain nature. And part of that nature is that uh, God doesn't die uh, as God. He's eternal. He, he never has had a beginning. He's always been, as far as, as our relationship to, relationship to him goes. Uh, he's, he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. So he's got all of, the, all of these all-powerful things. That's part of his nature. Uh, and for God not to have those, for, for God not to have, for example, all knowledge, then we wouldn't classify him as God. We might classify him as something else, but he wouldn't be classified as God, because remember, God is not his name. God is his nature. That, that's what he is. That's his nature. Just like human is not our name, but that's what our nature is. And so God, God's nature is one that is divine, uh, one that knows all things, all powerful and all that. And so Jesus gave up the nature and the quality of being God and the characteristics of God in order to limit himself to become a man. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that Jesus is subject to all the limitations that you and I are subject to. If you come over to John chapter 7, we're, we're going to notice this. Uh, you know, the, there, there was a few months ago, maybe a year ago, because time flies when you're getting old, uh, that, that um, there was a, a movie that came out that called The Young Messiah. And it was supposed to be about the early life of Jesus. And in one of the scenes, it has Jesus, the little boy, walking on the beach, and he finds a dead, a dead bird. And so it's kind of like nobody's watching, so he, he goes down there, and he, he resurrects the bird, and the bird flies off, you know. Well, that's great if he has a nature like what? Like God. But if he has a nature like man, you can't do that. We've all, had, we've all had goldfish or fish. We've all had dogs or cats or pets. And what happens to them? They die, and there's nothing we can do about them. I mean, I mean before they die, we take them to the vet to try to keep them alive, right? And sometimes we spend lots of money on them trying to keep them alive is what, what we're trying to do. But once they're, they're gone, we can't do anything about it. Well, why? Because of our nature. We're limited to that. We're, we're, lim we're not capable of doing that. Now, God is capable of doing that, but we're not. So in John chapter 7, one of the things that you find is you find Jesus' brothers. Now, if Jesus was doing this kind of stuff, or if Jesus had the ability to do miracles, you might say, or if Jesus manifested the nature of God when he was in the nature of man, 
uh, then certainly people around him would see it, would know it, people that lived with him. But in, in uh, uh, John 7, and verse 1, it says, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. In other words, after he began his ministry, he was walking in Galilee, uh, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So Jesus is making an impact of where people want to, where the Jewish community or the, the Pharisees and the religious community want to kill him uh, because he's starting this movement, okay? And so in relation to that movement, it says in verse 2, now the feast of the Jews, the, the feast of Booth was near. Now, if you're, if you're a politician and you're starting a movement, you want to be where? Where the crowds are. So the crowd's going to be in Jerusalem because they're going to have this feast, and so that's where you want to be, Right? And it says uh, in verse 3, And therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. In other words, his, in other words, his brothers said to him, Look, you're trying to be this great politician. You're, you know, you're claiming to be this, this Messiah, or at least you're doing you know, this public activity. So why don't you go to, Jer to Jerusalem? Because that's where the crowds are going to be, right? Uh, and so that's what he says to them. Now, that's what the brother said, said to him. Now, he, verse 4, here's why. He says, for no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. In other words, he says the politician doesn't hide himself. Politician goes out and does stuff in public so that he can make an impact, right? And then it says, for, uh, if, if you do these things, show yourself uh, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you're trying to be this politician guy, then go out and, and show yourself to the crowd. Now, verse 5 says, For not even his brothers were believing in him. So they had heard about the miracles that he did, but they hadn't uh, seen any. And so here you have his brothers that for 30 years they lived with him. Well, the, he was older, so maybe it was, you know, 28 years or 29 years or whatever. But they lived with him for 20 years, and yet they didn't recognize him as the Son of God. And you might say, well, what about Mary? She knew. Yeah, but the Bible says that she kept all these things to herself. Mary didn't run around telling people that she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Uh, what, what, would, what would you think if Rosalind comes in and she says, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Or you think she's crazy, right? So, so Mary didn't run around telling that to people, so she kept that in her heart. So not, not even, she didn't even tell her sons, you know, how Jesus was conceived. And, and as a result of that, the sons grew up with Jesus, and they didn't think Jesus was anybody special. They didn't think he was any more special than anybody else because they didn't believe in him. They didn't, they, they, they didn't put their, their confidence in him or their trust in him because he was just a regular man. And if he was just a regular man, we don't put our confidence in men. We put our confidence in God. And so, apparently, when Jesus became human, the nature of humanity, he gave up the qualities of God that would make him seem like he's God. Now, here, here's the difficult part for us because of the way we think, but that doesn't mean that Jesus was not all God. He is God. Our problem is that we, when we think of the characteristics of God, uh, uh, we, we think of his, his omnipresence, omnipotence, so therefore if Jesus doesn't have that, he can't be God. Well, that's what God does. That's not who God is, okay? Uh, you and I know that most humans can talk, right? So if you have somebody who can't talk, does that mean he's not human? No, no he's human. And that's the reason why when somebody has a, a, a birth and the, the birth, the baby's special needs, we know what that means, okay? We don't go, oh, the baby's not human, let's throw him out, like, like we would if somebody found a rat, right? Let's just get rid of the rat. Well, that's not what we do with, with our special needs kids. What do we do with them? We love them, we take care of them, and we nurture them. Why? Because they're human, right? So we have to understand the difference between the activity of God and who God is. And sometimes we get that confused. And so some people say, well, Jesus can't be all God. Well, Jesus can be all God, but he just doesn't do God's stuff. That, that's what he gave up. He, he gave up the, 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 the nature of God and his, 
his brothers didn't even realize it. Well, why didn't they? Because he wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary. Ex yes. That's right. That's right. So he's 100% man, he's 100% God, yes. So that Yeah, that's right. In, in the same way we're subject to death. Okay, okay? He, he, he's, he's subject to death in the same way you and I are. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, his brothers didn't even see him. So apparently this young Messiah movie that's depicting Jesus as, as a little kid running around doing miracles isn't true. And I mean, we know it's not true because the Bible doesn't doesn't teach us anything. And that's one of the reasons why in the in the Bible, how much of the early life of Jesus do you have recorded? We have his birth. We have when he was 12 years old. And that's it. That's all. Nothing else. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 but nothing else. Well, why not? Because his life is an ordinary, normal life. Right. When I die, nobody's going to know about my life because I have a normal, ordinary life. Right. Okay, I might like to think my, my grandkids might remember me for a little while, but even they're going to forget about me after a while. And, and why? Because I had a normal life, didn't do anything out of the ordinary, nothing major, didn't do any you know, miracles or anything like that. So... You know they're not going to remember, and that's why we in, in the life of uh, in the life of Jesus we don't have very much of his early life. We don't have his activity. We don't have him going to school. We don't have him, you know, uh, uh, dealing with with the problems of, of of life because they're all normal and everybody knows them. All right. So, uh, yes. That's right. Adam and Eve were all grown up when they when they were made right. Okay, so you have true or false. Prior to the coming of the Spirit, most people saw Jesus as just an ordinary man. That would be true, wouldn't it? Uh, and uh, on that page, that would be true. Okay, now, at Jesus, after the Spirit comes upon him, let's see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus. Okay, it says, uh, write down a passage that says when Jesus received the Holy Spirit. Well, when did Jesus receive the Holy Spirit? Okay, in Matthew chapter 3 is one of those places, right? Matthew chapter 3 is talking about Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, um, it says in Matthew chapter 3, and down here at verse, um, verse 13, it starts in Matthew 3, 13, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so, when, when did the Holy Spirit come down on Jesus? When he was baptized, and it was a visible and audible manifestation of the Spirit. Well, the Spirit was visible. The Spirit came down and lit, lit on him, but uh, John also heard an audible voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son. So he sees, he hears, he's experiencing this, so he can be a witness of who Jesus is. Now, in John 1 and verse 29... John 1 and verse 29, when John is talking about Jesus and the activity of Jesus, uh, and remember that John had been making disciples, right? Mm -hmm. And as he was teaching his disciples, what was his main, what was his main lesson as disciples? There's one coming after me who's greater than I. He's the one who baptized you in the spirit and in fire, right? Okay, and, and so... Uh, that was his main message. So now Jesus comes on the scene, and John then has to do the next thing. And what's the next thing? Well, he has to transfer his disciples 
over to Jesus if John did a good job. If John did a good job, the disciples are going to leave, John's disciples are going to leave him, and they're going to go over to Jesus because he's the one that John was talking about. So, First John one verse twenty nine. The idea though is, which guy or which person is John going to send his disciples to? Right, John one twenty nine says the next day he John saw Jesus coming to him and said, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." This is he uh, on, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I do, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. So John says, as he's looking at Jesus coming, he says, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, how do I know that? He says, I didn't recognize him. He says, I, I didn't come up with it on my own. That's what he means by I didn't recognize him. Okay. He says, I, I didn't figure this out on my own. It's not like, you know, I sat around and figured out that he's the one. He says, but that's why I came. That's why I came baptizing people. I came baptizing people so that I could identify or we could identify who the person is that's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire, okay? And, and, and that's why he said uh, in verse 31, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Now, here's what you need to remember. John knew who Jesus was. Who was Jesus? His cousin. It was his cousin. I'm sure occasionally they would get together like all family does, and, you know, they would run around with each other. They would do stuff with each other. So it's not, John isn't saying, I don't know who Jesus is. Je John knows Jesus' is cousin. He's his family. Okay, he knows him. But he doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't know Jesus is the one who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And so it says in verse uh, 31, I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. So John says, let me tell you what I did see. I did see that the Holy Spirit came down and rested on Jesus. Well, when did that happen? When he was baptized. John said, I, I came baptizing so that you might know who the one is. So Jesus didn't come just to baptize people and get them ready for God. He also came to, to identify the Messiah. That was, what, that was one of his, his main tasks. And he says uh, in verse 32, he says, John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me. Now, who sent him to baptize in water? God. Remember when Jesus asked the Pharisees the baptism of John, is it from heaven or from men? Remember that? And they refused to answer because they said, if we say it's from heaven, then he, Jesus is going to ask us, why didn't we do it? So we know that he came from heaven. John didn't invent baptism on his own. John didn't say, I think I'll just start baptizing people. It's from heaven. Now, some people might have been doing that for other reasons, but John was doing it because it, from, it's from heaven. God told him to do that. Now, he says, I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So, how did John, who was over here, how did John know that Jesus was the Messiah when not even Jesus' brothers knew that he was the Messiah. Because he saw the Holy Spirit come on Jesus. And God had told him, when you see the Holy Spirit come on somebody when you're baptizing them, when you see the Holy Spirit come on that person, then you know he's the one. So, without the Holy Spirit, John wouldn't know what? Who the one is. There is no way to identify that Jesus is the one 
without the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Again, that doesn't mean that your eyes are blind until the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then after the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you can see Jesus and identify him as Jesus. It's not what it means. What it means is, is the job of the Holy Spirit, as we've been trying to point out to you, is to testify and to keep the information about God so that you then can make a decision because we're saved by faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and the Word of God came by the Holy Spirit. That's what that verse means. And everywhere you look at where Jesus, somebody says, oh, that's, that's the Messiah, they can only say that because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Even today, the only way you can identify that Jesus is the one you should be following instead of Muhammad, or instead of uh, Joseph Smith, or instead of Mike, is how? By the Holy Spirit. Now, if you use a different book to try to figure out who your religious leader is, guess what? You're going to be confused. But if you use the Bible, which came by the Holy Spirit, now what? You're going to say Jesus, Lord. And he also says, and no one by the Spirit says Jesus is accursed. In other words, the Holy Spirit doesn't come along and say Jesus is a bad guy or Jesus is accursed. The Holy Spirit does say that if you follow Mike, you're cursed, and so is Mike. But the Holy Spirit never says Jesus is accursed. So there's no way for you to identify who the Lord is except by the Holy Spirit, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's always been the work of the Holy Spirit. That continues to be the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, therefore, is still here, still among us, trying to preserve so that we might be able to live by faith. And so what role did the Holy Spirit have in John knowing who Jesus was? He identified him. He was direct. He, 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 without the Holy Spirit... John would know, okay? And not just the Holy Spirit coming down, but John had to see it. John had to see it happen, okay, in order, for, in order for that. And by the way, I think that's the big problem today is people don't want to see the information of God. They don't want to see the conclusions that the Word of God teaches us, and therefore they feel okay while they go about their busy little lives. Yes? You know, another thing, too, you know, Jesus wasn't the only person Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was the only one that had Holy Spirit come down on him after he was baptized. Right. right? All right. Now, uh, in, in John 2 and verses 1 through 10, uh, we have Jesus' first miracle. And of course, you, you know what that is, right? Let, let's, let's take a real quick look and just, just read it real quick, and then we'll make a couple of points about it. All right, here's what it says. It says, on the third day, uh, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me, with, uh, with us? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now that there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each, Jesus said to them, fill, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the, way, to the head waiter. So they took it to, the, to him, and when the head waiter tasted the water which had, been, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, but when the people have drunk freely, they serve the poorest wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in, Gal in Cain of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. So, 
It wasn't until the Holy Spirit had come on Jesus and Jesus begins to do activity that only God can do, and Jesus begins to do that, that's when the people could see his glory. You see his glory. Now, what did he give up when he left heaven? His glory. What can they see now when the Holy Spirit comes down on him and Jesus is now doing the activity of God? What can they now see? They can now see his glory. They can now see his nature. They can now see who he really is, even though he, when he first got there and lived there for 30 years, didn't do a single miracle. This is indicating that he always was and always has been God. And it's the signs that he's doing. And the other thing is, is it says here, this was the first sign that he did. So he didn't do any other miracles before this one. This was the first one that he did. And this happened only after the Holy Spirit came on him. Because as a man, as a, as a normal man with normal nature, he can't do a miracle. But the Holy Spirit is not just a man. The Holy Spirit is who? God. And so if God comes on Jesus then Jesus has the power of God, and therefore he can do the miracles to indicate that he too is God. And by the way, here's another thing. In the Old Testament, it says that God does not share his glory with anybody else. Okay? What did they see in Jesus? Glory. God's glory. Yeah. It's not God's glory. What they see. All right. So, uh, in John 3, and verse 34, there, this is a discussion about testimony. Remember when it says testimony, that means witnesses. It just, it just simply means witness. Uh, I am surprised at how often because we we ourselves live in our religious culture how we sometimes take a lot of the words in the bible and we try to make them into some religious culture definitions instead of just looking at them as regular definitions what does testimony mean Witness. It means a witness. That, that's all that it means. It's not, it's not supernatural. It's, it just means a witness. So let's see what it says here, because they're, they're arguing about the witness or the testimony. Verse 32, John, uh, John 3, 32 says, uh, What he has seen and heard of this he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Now, you have some fill in the blanks here. It says, For whom God has speaks the of God for he gave the without measure. So Jesus had the spirit without measure. And we've talked about this before. God gave the Holy Spirit to the apostles, but he didn't give it to them without measure. The apostles shared the Holy Spirit with uh, some of the disciples, but they didn't have it without measure. Jesus had it without measure. What does it mean without measure? No limit. He had no limit. Well, why didn't Jesus, why didn't God give the Holy Spirit to the apostles with no limit? Because they're men. Well, no, it's not just to make them equal with him. They don't, we don't have the capacity to be all powerful and almighty and use it in a way that's going to be beneficial. I don't know how many of you ever saw the movie uh, Bruce Almighty. Did you ever see the movie Bruce Almighty? Okay, I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a comical show, but you know, it kind of when you when you think about it, it kind of makes you think. What would you do if you had all the power of God? What would you do with it? Well, you'd do stupid stuff like he did. That's what we'd do. Why? Because we're not capable of handling it. We would use it in our own selfish interest, in our own selfish ways, and that's why we never get the spirit without measure. But Jesus did, and why did Jesus get the spirit without measure? Because he's God. Because he knows how to handle it. He can use it properly. He uses it in love and, and respect. And he doesn't abuse his power. But we would. That's what we would do. All right. Now, uh, in John 3, 
Uh, it said, uh, well, in our notes here, it says, uh, Jesus and the miracles he performed by the Spirit. It says, how did Nicodemus say he knew Jesus was from God? Well, it's in this same chapter here, to the beginning of this chapter, where we have Nicodemus. You remember who Nicodemus is, right? Who was he? He was a ruler of the Jews. He was somebody who taught the Jews and somebody who cared about God, right? It says in John 3, 1, it says, Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs or miracles that you do unless God is with him. So at least Nicodemus uh, understood that the signs, the signs that Jesus was doing indicates that he had a relationship with God that nobody on earth at that time had except for Jesus. Now, you, you remember that Jesus came right after the 400 years of what? Silence. N nobody had received any message from the Holy Spirit except for uh, uh, Zacharias, John's dad, and then Mary, of course, who had, had Jesus, right? But they, uh, uh, God wasn't really talking with people during that time. We don't, have any, we don't have any prophets. We don't have any records of anything that was written by inspiration. We have some books of history that were written during that time, the Maccabees and books like that, but we don't have any, any inspired writings during that time. And so here, Jesus then is identified as the one who has the word. And so he gave him the spirit without measure. Uh, and so in John 3, uh, uh, we have the fact that Nicodemus identified Jesus by the signs that he saw, by the signs. That's why I, I always tell you, if somebody comes to you and say, God wants me to tell you something, what do you ask them? Show me a sign that I know you're from God. And people go, wait, well, you can't do that. Yes, I can the Pope tells me to do something. Show me that you're from God. If I can't find the Bible, you show me you're from God and I'll, I'll, I'll think about doing it. What's he going to have to do? At least do some kind of miracle, right? And then even after he does the miracle, I need to check it according to what? According to what God, God already, already revealed. If it goes against what God already revealed, I know it's not true. And, and that's what God told us in Deuteronomy chapter 18 when he talked about how you would identify a real prophet from a false one. So, uh, Nicodemus identified Jesus by the signs of the Spirit. Yes? So, so uh, I think talking about the five days later, um, that's why the Old Testament Yes. Yeah, some of the apocryphal books were written during that time. There's also ap apocryphal books that were written over here after the apostles wrote the Bible. There's some apocryphal books over there, but the Old Testament ones happened between the Testaments. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they have the Book of Enoch. Uh, they have a book called the Book of, uh, of, of Jasser, I believe. Uh, they have, they have uh, is it the second, second uh, book of the Song of Solomon, I think. Uh, if you, you want to know uh, some of them that are considered... Um, yeah, historical. Just look in the Catholic Bible. In the Old Testament, the Catholic Bibles, I, I believe they have six more books than the, what we would call the Protestant Bible. But what's interesting is none of those books have any doctrine in them that changes anything. Yes? So, um, is it the Enoch that walked with God? Yes. At least that's what they say. Uh, I'm not telling you it's true. Uh, I'm just saying that that's that's supposed to be the, the author of the book of, of Enoch, okay? Uh, just like over here, uh, after the apostles wrote the Bible, you have uh, the, the uh, book of um, uh, the gospel. I think it's the gospel of Jude and the gospel of somebody else. Uh, and, and they're basically books that, that people wrote and they just attached the, you know, one of the apostles' name to them. And so, so those are the apocryphal books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, um, they, they, they can recognize who Jesus is by the miracles that he does, right? Okay. 
Uh, and so you, sh you should have filled that in while I was reading that for you, if you hadn't filled it in, uh, so you can have it. Now, uh, in John 9, in verse 25 through 34, we're going to notice the role of the Spirit as we look at it. 25, starting verse 20, 25. Okay, and it talks about the, the role of identifying Jesus. So let's read this together. Verse 25, it says this. So a second time, they called the, the man who had been a blind. So this is referring to the incident when Jesus healed the blind man. You remember that? Okay. And, and the Pharisees didn't really want to believe in it, right? And so they're trying to, they're trying to discredit the blind man. So verse, verse 20, 24 says, So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is not a sinner. Now, I'm sorry, is a sinner. Sorry, is a sinner. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that, that, he, uh, that the Pharisees say, give, give the glory to God. So what they're saying is, if this was a real miracle, if this was really something that was healed, who gets the glory for it? God does. But they don't want to say that about Jesus. See, that's why they're doing this. They don't want to say Jesus is God. Because if Jesus is God, what do they have to do? Believe him and follow him, and they don't want to. They're going to lose their power. They're going to lose their control. They're going to lose their religious followings, okay? And, and, and that's why some preachers like to be called reverend, and they like titles, and they like of, official positions because they want to, they think that those, those titles and those positions are going to keep them in religious power, and so therefore, you got to use those titles in referring to them. People, people say, Mike, what do you want me to call you? Mike. My name. My name is Mike. I mean Mike. Because you don't follow me. I, I, there's, no, there's no significance in who I am. Nothing. Okay? It depends on what God says about things. That's what matters. That's what I say about things. So, it, what's, what's interesting is they say, give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. The, the blind man then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Now, there was no question that Jesus was the one who did this. That's why when the blind man, when they say, well, Jesus is a sinner, uh, the blind man goes, well, I don't know about that. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. And Jesus did it. You know, that's what I know. <clears throat> and verse 26, so they said to him, what did he do to you? Okay. How did he open your eyes? Did he have surgery on your eyes? Did he put ointment on your eyes? Did he come up with some new drug or something that, that made you well and you could see? That's what they're really asking. You know, is what was the mechanism behind him opening your eyes? Was it some kind of natural remedy that maybe we, nobody knows about? And so they asked him, how did, how did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you do not listen. Why do you want, me, why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? He says, I already told you, and you don't, you, don't want to you don't want to listen. If I tell you again, do you want to follow him? Do you want to become his disciples? They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where, where he is from. So they said, we believe Moses. Well, Moses wrote about Jesus. I, I, I was going over the Old Testament with, with somebody, and we were going over some of the some of the miracles and or some of the some of the uh, rituals uh, that were in there. Like, for example, the the uh, Passover. Okay, and we were talking about. Do you realize that without Jesus, all of the symbolism of the Passover is worthless? It doesn't mean anything. Why in the world kill it at twilight? I don't know. Why in the world does it have to be a male? I don't know. Why does it have to not have his bones broken? I don't know. Why in the world does it have to be roasted? I don't know. But if you understand that that's Old Testament is pointing out Jesus, 
then every single one of those items makes perfect sense. Jesus was a male. They didn't break his bones. He was, ju he was judged by God, which is the idea of roasting him. He was, he was judged by God whole. They didn't cut him apart, okay? And so Jesus is identified in the Old Testament by Moses as being, as being the one whom they knew was going to come. But these guys say, we don't know who he is. We follow Moses, but we don't know who Jesus is. So you know what that tells you? You can be religious and have no idea about God. Isn't that interesting? You can be religious all your life and not know anything about God. You can know a lot about religion, but nothing about God. I find that fascinating. And I also find it kind of intimidating that maybe I could be preaching all, all these years and not, not know God. I think we, think we need to be careful. So they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. And we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's from. And the man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes? He's, he says, really? He says, you guys have no idea where he's from? But he, 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 he opened my eyes? He says, we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? So they put him out. You think you're smarter than we are? Why, we're religious people. You think you know more than we do? Why? You were born in sin. We weren't born in sin. You were born in sin. And you're trying to teach us? And he threw him out of the synagogue. And it's amazing that this whole dissertation here started because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, which they considered a work. Right, exactly, which they considered a work. But that's the day God works. God works on the Sabbath. God works on the Sabbath so you don't have to work. That's the idea of the Sabbath. God says, I will feed you. I will take care of you. I will give you what you want. God's working on the Sabbath day. The, the idea is we don't have to work since God's working. Since God's working, I don't have to work. See, we have this idea that on the seventh day, God just stopped doing everything and just sat there and with a blank stare on his face until time ends. That's why Jesus says God has been working until now and I'm working. He didn't stop working. That was just a figure of him finishing creation. That's what that has reference to. God's always been working. And they, have, they don't seem to understand that the priest worked on the Right. Exactly. So what extent is the priest? And here's Jesus, who is our high priest, and he's working on the Sabbath, and they don't believe it. Exactly. But our point in this lesson is that the reason that the blind man could identify Jesus as coming from God was why? The miracle that he did. And how was Jesus able to do the miracle? By the Holy Spirit. So how was the blind man able to say Jesus is Lord? By the Holy Spirit. What if the Holy Spirit hadn't come? And the blind man would still be blind and no one would know who Jesus is. So the only way, the only way you can say Jesus Lord is by the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. So what do you think our job needs to be for people to be able to say Jesus Lord? What? Tell them about the word. 
Take the Bible to them. Show them what the Holy Spirit says. Show them what, what the Holy Spirit says. Show them what the Holy Spirit do, did. Show, show them the miracles the Holy Spirit did in the Bible. That's how you know. Not, I'm going to do a miracle so you follow me. And that's what happens with a lot of people or individuals who say they have the ability to do miracles and, 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 and those kind of things. What do they get? They get big followings of them. It doesn't do you any good to follow me. You're supposed to follow Jesus. All right. So, our question here. Read John 9, 25 through 34, and tell me the role of the, of the miracles played in proving the identity of Jesus. What did he do? He healed the blind man, opened his eyes. And the blind man even said, nobody's ever done that. Now, in our day and time, I think there, there has been some procedures where individuals were born blind and they figured out what they needed to do in order to help them see. Uh, and there's a, a couple of movies about, about that. But during that time, and of course, that takes medical procedure. I mean, it's not like, you know, the, the doctor says, open your eyes. Uh, but, he, but up to this time in, in uh, John's day, nobody, nobody ever had opened the eyes of a person born blind. From the, from the time that they, they were born, they were blind and they never could see. Nobody's ever opened their eyes. All right, now, John 20. Verse 30 and 31. Here's the end of the book of John. And remember that the book of John is different than the synoptic gospels in that John's goal is to try to get people to understand who Jesus is and who, who, um, uh, where he came from and his identity. And so in John 20, as he writes, the, writes the, a couple of phrases at the end of his book, it says, in John 20 and 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of, his, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So, what did John say? that the miracles of Jesus were supposed to prove or do for us. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Lord. And why do you need to believe that? So you can have eternal life. Because there is no life any other way. God is the source of life. He always has been. That's what the evolutionists don't want to admit. The evolutionists don't, the evolutionists don't want to admit that there's only one source of life, and that is life. Life doesn't come from dead things. Life comes only from life. And so something has always had to be eternal. There always had to be life, period. Now, they might say, oh, well, it's alien life. Fine. Let's talk about alien life then. But there had to be life. It didn't start by some, some cosmic dust somewhere that had no life in it, and then all of a sudden, life came to be. That's not how life works. Life comes from life. So if you want to live, then the only way you can have that for certain is by believing in the one who provides life, who is the source of life, who is the word of life. That's God. Not a church, not a preacher, not a, philo not a philosophy or a, a way of thinking, but God himself. God himself. All right. So, page 35. The Spirit raised Jesus to prove he was the Son of God. Because the requirement or the, well, I guess you could say the requirement, the, the necessity uh, of the resurrection proves 
that Jesus can take care of what for us? Death. That's what we're afraid of, death. People don't, people don't want to die. We don't want to die, so we take vitamins, we go work out, we, we do everything we can. We go to the doctor, uh, we do everything we can so that, we, so that we'll live. And, you know, some people who are so afraid of, die, uh, of dying, they, you know, they, they bought into the cryogenics movement that we had, you know, a number of decades ago. They, they freeze your body, and, and, and then when society develops enough to cure the disease that killed you, they'll unfreeze you, they'll, they'll cure your disease, and it'll bring, put you back to life. Yeah, that's all the same idea. We're afraid to die, okay? We're, we're afraid of dying. So in order for Jesus to be the God that we follow, he needs to prove that he can overcome death. Romans 1. Verse 1. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the, uh, for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets, the whole Holy Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, the Holy Spirit said what about Jesus? That he was going to be raised from the dead and declared to be the Son of God. So how can you know that Jesus is Lord? By looking at the clouds? By looking at a tree? By, by looking at other people? How's the only way you can identify that Jesus is Lord? By the work of the Holy Spirit. So without going any, without even going any further, what do you think the work of the Holy Spirit is? Give you the information so you can believe in Jesus. What if you never do a miracle? Yeah. Not his work. His work isn't to make sure you do miracles. His work is to identify the information so that you can make a decision about whether you want to serve God or not. And don't misunderstand that. I don't mean to say that the Holy Spirit backs off and isn't doing anything. I believe he is. He's trying to get the word of God into people trying to get the word of God into other countries. He's trying to get the word of God into families. He's trying to get the word of God wherever he can. He's trying to get the word of God everywhere. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing, here's the thing to think about. What is the mechanism by which the Holy Spirit does that? Through, through Christ's body. Isn't that how you do stuff? Don't you do stuff through your body? How does God do stuff? Through his body. When, when, when Albert goes to Vacaville, what's Albert supposed to be doing? Showing the word. We're supposed to be doing. Showing the word. When we talk with our friends, rather than talking about football and sports and basketball and all that, maybe we need to tell them about the word. Instead of reading our children all the... Uh, who are those fairy tales, grim, uh, grim fairy tales or Mother Goose and all those fairy tales? Maybe we need to tell them the true tales about the people of God. Get the word of God in them. That's how the Holy Spirit functions with us. It's by faith. It's by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Does that mean God can't do any miracles? God can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. But that's the function of the Holy Spirit. So, 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. You have one more, and then we'll quit here right after this. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. It says, For Christ also died for sins 
once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So what was the Holy Spirit do doing during the time that Noah was building the ark? Waiting patiently. So the Holy Spirit's just going, hmm, hmm. No, the word was being preached. Noah, why are you building that ark? It ha it ha There's rain? What's rain? There's going to be a flood? We don't live close to a river, Noah. Why are you building an ark? Because God says there's going to be a flood. God says you better be careful. God says you better listen to him. Guess what's being preached? The word of God. You come to church on Sundays, the neighbors go, why do you go to church so much? Because God's coming. I want to make sure I know how to please him, how to serve him. Why do you read your Bible so much? Because God's coming. He's trying, to, he's trying to tell me how to be a better person, how to live right. Why, why do you care whether there's abortions or not? Because God's coming. What do you care whether people are homosexual or not? Because God's coming. Now, if you don't care about God coming, then you won't care about any of those things. It won't matter to you. But if you think God's coming, all those things become paramount. And they determine, those things determine whether we really do believe God's coming or not. In Noah's day, there was eight people saved. Let's pray. Yes. That's right. It's only through Jesus we have, we have eternal life. That's right. Exactly. Let's pray. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for every blessing. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that we have in your son, Jesus, because we know that we're sinful. We know that we fall short. Sometimes you have to hit us over the head to help us understand that, Father, but we know that we are. We're so thankful that you have sent your Holy Spirit to help us, that we might know the truth and that we might turn from our sinful way and follow and serve you. Because, Father, you are the only source of life. So we pray that we might cling to you, and that we might love you, and that we might tell other people about the great blessings we have in you. We ask that you forgive us for our sins and watch over us. Pray that you be with Leroy, especially at this time as he's going to the doctor to check on some difficulties he's been having in his chest. We pray for all those, Father, that we mentioned before that are having difficulty in the flesh we pray, Father, that you just bless us according to your desire and our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.